This is Matthew McConaughey. Natalie Portman. James Patterson. Michael Ian Black. And you are listening to Five Questions with Dan Chabell. Rodney, welcome to Five Questions. Thank you for having me as a guest on your show. What did you learn from working under David Letterman that helped you succeed in Hollywood? Good question. That's 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 worthy of one of your five. Um, uh, I would say I learned don't be precious. There's, you know, that's a that's a, a that was a show and it was a job where there were two hundred plus episodes a year. So whether you just produced the greatest, most legendary piece of comedy of all time or one of the worst things to ever stink up the airwaves, either way, you had another show the next day and it didn't matter anymore. Um, so when you when you are producing things at that volume, you um, you learn to to be a little less precious about things. Um, having said that, I've forgotten that lesson since I worked on that show. And now I'm I'm very precious about everything. Yeah. And I feel like people's attention span is like five seconds now, but we're our own worst critic. Mm -hmm. So we're always like, oh, I wish I could have done that better. Or maybe I regret this. But the reality is, as you know, it's what's the next project? What's the You're always kind of doing the next thing anyway. So if you linger too much on the past or as you were saying, you know, you produce so many shows a year, like that's not that's only going to hold you back from producing mm -hmm. better things in the future. Exactly. And, and, you know, another thing that springs to mind is that um, just working for Dave, he he was by the time I worked for him, he was already a, an icon of of pop culture. He was insanely famous and successful. Um, and he was and he could be particular and he could be idiosyncratic, um, but he was a straight shooter and he was not two faced. And I, I definitely came to admire that about him and sought to emulate that quality of his later on, especially once I got out of that environment and, and learned that not everyone in my business um, only had one face. Let's put it that way. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, how hard was it to bring a character like Miles Morales to life on the big stream? And why do you think he resonates with audiences? Um, as far as why he resonates with audiences, I think a lot of audiences um, see themselves in him in, in, in different qualities that he has. He's he's a character that, you know, like Peter Parker, but different. He is, he, you know, he's he's a character that many people can identify with you know with with various aspects of miles so that that is why he caught on um people felt that the character was speaking to them and and for them um and as far as you know helping to bring that character to life um it you know i, I would say that the answer is relatively true for almost any animated character you're seeking to make a character that's completely fabricated by hand and computer um you're trying to make that character be believable and you're trying to make that character a character that provokes deep emotion in an audience so all of the work comes from from studying all of the techniques and illusions and you know and imbuing this this uh character that is not real with what feels to an audience like extraordinary realness um that is that is where all the work lies definitely and I, i've been a comic book collector and marvel and dc fan since i was a kid and so you we always hope as audience members i really hope they do this character justice i obviously hope he resonates and uh and you know obviously you know some characters have more than others right and so especially you know in marvel and dc you know, with with a lot of the characters that have been brought up to life, it's it feels a little bit hit or miss. But these are characters that you know could always surface again in the future. And uh, you know, there's there's been so many renditions of these characters. If you think about Joker and Batman as well, like how many people have played Batman over the years? You know, and so I do feel like this there's this always this opportunity to reinvent and kind of tweak and and kind of evolve characters as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, you know. Miles Morales, you know, being um, a successful, you know, or, or connecting with audiences is is more than anything. It's a testament to 
um, you know, Shamik, who, who was the voice performer that drove Miles, and then many, many, you know, you know, 100, 100 plus uh, uh, animators who were performing Miles um, through animation, you know, um, and who are, you know, as much actors as any actor you see in front of a camera. Yeah, when you talk to kids and you ask them who's their Spider-Man, they they lean a little bit more to Miles than mm-hmm. Peter Parker. Whereas my generation, we're more Peter Parker. So it it's almost like, yeah, of course they're both Spider-Man, but there's there's something about each that appeals to different generations as well, which makes it very special. Yeah. Your, your generation has to get with it. <laughs> yeah. We, we will. Left we will. by hand. Yeah. Left by hand. <laughs> Yeah. What were the challenges of using innovative technology to tell the stories you wanted to in the Spider-Verse movies? Um, the challenges, there's, I mean, it's nothing but challenges all day, every day, because you're trying to um, tell a story successfully, you know, and emotionally that um, in a way that hasn't been done before. And that at the start of the project, nobody actually knows how to do. Uh, you have to invent Everything you have to repurpose pre-existing tools and pipelines. You have to invent completely new tools. It's um, it's a painful, uh, painstaking process that that can take years and that can require spending significant you know chunks of those years in the dark and feeling like it's not going to work. Um, so yeah, the challenge is is you know when you when you take on the the, the challenge of doing things in a new way, um, you have to, you know, you, know, you, you have to take all the, the one million punches in the face that comes with, you know, trying to make that ambition um, pay off. And there's a challenge with success too. The first movie did so well, but there's no guarantee the next one will or the next one will, right? And so, and, mm-hmm. and people want to see those characters and, and you know, these new stories and that mm-hmm. development. And then that's its own challenge. So just because, you know, one movie does well, or, you know, people resonated with it doesn't mean that people are going to have the same attachment to the second one or the third one. And so, so, and, and I'm sure you're the, you seem like the type of person that wants to keep raising the stakes and challenging yourself as well. Otherwise you wouldn't have, you know, gone through this whole process. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a tall order for the next uh, one to, to continue to innovate at the same pace while also delivering something that, you know, feels of a piece with the first movie um you know and the i'm not directing the next movie but um but i've seen it and uh and the directors that are on that project are doing a, an amazing job you know uh so i think everyone is everyone just start getting excited they're they're meeting the challenge yeah and i i do think the challenge too is is you need to kind of cater to the hardcore kind of comic enthusiasts but also to the broader audience as well to take in more of the the moviegoers, right? So how do I do right by these people who've been following this character and reading the books and whatnot, but also make it more appealing to bring in more people outside of that because it's, you know, there's not like a trillion comic book collectors out there and readers. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And what inspired you to write a humor book about retiring so early in your career? And what does your vision of retirement look like? Mm. Wow. Yeah, when I was in my twenties, I wrote a book called Early Bird. It was it was about I took six months off and I moved into a retirement community in Florida, um, and I I tested retirement out early to see what all the hard work was about. Um, what inspired me to do that? I mean, what I, I mean, I don't know. What inspires me to do anything? Like a lot of times, um, a lot of times, if something seems uh, so pointless and so dumb that it makes me laugh to imagine doing it, then, um, then I'll do it. You know, you know, you know, then that's a good sign. You know, you know, people, when I work with people, I have to sometimes explain to them that when I call something dumb, that's like a high compliment, you know, like if I'm laughing and calling something dumb, it just means like, Oh my God, why would anyone spend time doing that? Let's all definitely spend time doing that. So, so that book came from that kind of an impulse. It, you know, and it also came from a piece of, of truth for me, you know, it always kind of comes from both at the same time. Um, you know, desire to do something, to do something that hasn't been done or that's silly or that seems absurd. And then, and then, you know, identifying with the idea feeling that there is something truthful about it. So for me, you know, 
at that time in my 20s when I was already working pretty hard, you know, questioning what all that work was leading towards and what was going to be the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. That was stuff that I was that I was feeling very acutely. So so that idea felt like the right kind of idea. It was silly and it spoke to something authentic that I was feeling at the time. Um, and what does retirement look like to me? I mean, gosh, um, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to retire. We'll see. You know, yeah. like, I, you know I'm, I'm thinking you say that because a lot of creatives think like that too, because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like you're, you're burned out as like a teacher or doctor and you, you're, you know, you've, you've kind of paid your dues and you're ready to retire and, and that's it. I feel like creative it's, you always want to create. Yeah, well, a doctor is like touching people's brains and stuff. So I can understand why, <laughs> when, for, for better or worse, when someone's 90, a patient, you know, they'd feel terrible, but they'd say, maybe let's get the guy who's not 90 to touch my brain. Um, but um, yeah, you know, you know uh, making art and being creative, you know, is stuff that is instinctive to me. It comes from a certain fundamental way that I move through the world. It comes from a certain restlessness that I feel it's hard to imagine not giving, you know, voice in some way to, to those sorts of impulses, but certainly, certainly people are going to take my um, audience away from me. <laughs> in some <laughs> Our audience will, will, you know, will be like, Hey, don't touch my brain um, figuratively. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so retirement to me, you know, I mean, I think it's probably continuing to be um, engaged in things that are, inspiring or motivating and meaningful to me and then it's also as much as possible being surrounded by and and you know um spending time with my family and loved ones and friends and and um you know that that would be the dream of um of retirement and what's your best piece of career advice my best piece of career advice um my best piece of career advice is that there's more than one way to get to the same place. That's my best piece of career advice. So as far as what that means, you know, that means something to me creatively, um, especially when you're collaborating with other people, you can spend a lot of time in conflict or arguing. And, um, and I just genuinely believe that at a certain point you, you know, it's best for, for, uh, a team of collaborators to pick a way to go, whether it's right or wrong, doesn't really matter. You can always make an adjustment, um, but there's more than one way to get to the same place. Everyone wants to get to the same place. They just are arguing over which direction to go. Uh, eventually just pick a direction and as much as you can try to stack hands and get there. And, and like I said, if, if you're not getting there, then you can talk about um, how to adjust and you could argue over that. Um, and that and movie's got to come out, right? You can't, exactly, you can't argue exactly. about that for a year and be delayed. Exactly. So, so I think that's true for, for creative pursuits. And then I think it's true about careers generally. There's more than one way to get to the same place. Uh, and often to get to the place that you're trying to get to or the good place, you have to travel through the bad place. Um, you know, every time in my career that I've hit a pinnacle or a moment of achievement or success, whether it's an obvious one or, or an internal one. Um, I've reminded myself that I had to travel through all of the bad stuff on the way to get to that place and that there was no other way to get there. Um, I try to remember that. Um, and I try to remind myself of that when I'm, when I'm not in a great place, which, which is, which is a, you know, a, a certain amount of the time for sure. Well, that's great advice. And thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you.